From the European Parliament here in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight and we have a lot in store for you on the menu. Salzburg stakes. We take the temperature of negotiations over Brexit and migration. Summit snaps from ice cream to nutcrackers to Viktor Orban's jeans. And speaking of Viktor Orban, is Hungary's prime minister winning a PR war with the EU? Replacing May, a juicy memo dishes on Tory politicians waiting in the wings. And EU versus Amazon. Is Europe anti-tech or is it just ahead of its time? Thank you for joining us tonight. It's time to meet our panel. We have Sam Morgan with us. He is a reporter at Euractive in Brussels. Uh, Sam, what are you looking at tonight? Uh, Czech is dead on arrival, finally, at the <laughs> EU summit. Indeed, finally. Everyone, everyone is watching this story, indeed. And we also have Tomasz Bielecki with us. He's a Brussels correspondent for Poland's uh, Gazeta. W what are you watching? My main interest is uh, Viktor Orban and Hungary and uh, what he said and how he behaved also in Salzburg. For sure. All right. And also joining us tonight is Marianne Harkin. She's an Irish MEP for the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats in Europe. Marianne, what is taking your interest tonight? Well, I suppose like a lot of MEPs, especially Irish MEPs, I'm convulsed with Brexit. And, you know, the name of this programme is Raw Politics. That's what's happening in Salzburg and high drama to boot. The whole thing seems to me to be choreographed right. and everybody is speaking to their own audience. So it's and certainly interesting to watch. We will certainly go more into that. Uh, we will have first our top story, of course, the final deal of the EU leaders summit in Salzburg, as Marianne was saying. While this may be called an informal summit, there was still the obligatory family photo, as you can see there. And while they may look like one big happy gang, actually optimism wasn't strong going into this meeting. And we are now, you know, one of the major issues that we're looking at is, of course, Brexit, because late today, the leaders held a news conference and our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, he was there. Darren, what can you tell us about uh, what the leaders had to say tonight? Well, the mood music going into this special informal summit in the home of Mozart was all optimistic. It was about compromise. Compromise from uh, not just Britain, but indeed from the European Union. Yet, as this summit now wraps up, Actually, it's been quite devastating for Theresa May and primarily for her Chequers plan, her blueprint for the withdrawal agreement, Britain leaving the European Union. What we've heard uh, this afternoon is from the EU Council President, uh, Donald Tusk, saying that there has not been enough progress on that vexed issue of the Irish border. But also that Chequers, the plan that Theresa May says is her deal or no deal, well, he says it cannot work. Does that mean it's dead? And if it does, what ramifications are there? Will we potentially be staring at a no-deal Brexit? Let's listen to Donald Tusk speaking to reporters as this Salzburg summit came to a close. Everybody shared the view that while there are positive elements in the Chequers proposal, the suggested framework for economic cooperation will not work, not least because it risks undermining the single market. We also discussed the timetable for further negotiations. The moment of truth for Brexit negotiations will be the October European Council. In October, we expect maximum progress and results in the Brexit talks. To that, uh, listening to that speech, moment of truth and words were, you know, being used, no compromises. This is going to be difficult for Theresa May, isn't it, as you were, as you were saying earlier? Yeah, really difficult for Theresa May. First of all, we've got the European Union now seeing that her plan is now dead. We know that many within her own party, those hard Brexiteers, are also saying that Chequers is dead. And even some of her supporters within the Conservative Party now accepting that that plan is dead. And that means Theresa May is in a corner on all of this. She wanted to leave this summit, saying to her Conservative Party conference in a few weeks' time, Tessa, that the EU were engaging with Chequers. That is no longer the case. Where is her political manoeuvre? She has also got, what, just three or four weeks before this October summit, not just to come up with a new plan on the Irish border, which she said today she will do, but also essentially to redress the problem 
was checkers. Can she do it? Has she got the political manoeuvre, the space uh, to do it? Well, we're going to find that out over the next few weeks, but be in no doubt, this is squeaky bum time, uh, to use the football analogy for Brexit. We are looking potentially at no deal being back on the table because it seems that the EU are willing to essentially play Theresa May's bluff on this and say that her current plan, as Donald Tusk said this afternoon, is not going to work. All right, thank you for that, uh, Darren McCaffrey. I'll put it out to our panel tonight. I mean, the possibility of a no deal, did we, did we really need a special informal summit to come to that conclusion? I'll put that to you, Marion. OK, well, perhaps we did, because perhaps before now, nobody was prepared just to come out and say it. I mean, there was the back door of the backstop, if you like, would have allowed... On the, the Irish U border issue. Yes, yeah. would have allowed uh, the UK basically stay in the customs union. And that was never going to happen because that would just destroy the integrity of a customs union that the UK itself, you know, helped to set up. And they always knew this. So while we have, if you like, what, what the Irish government called a bulletproof declaration, Nonetheless, the mechanism for implementing that, proposed by Theresa May, contained so many holes that the EU just couldn't accept it. So we're at the point now where they've come out straight, they've said it, and now they have to sit down and negotiate something that works. And this is the really, as he said, squeaky bum and, time. And one of the points where there is no compromise, it is on the single market. I'll put that to you, Sam. I mean, even two years ago, they said no, no, no compromise on the single, uh, the movement of people, the movement of goods, capital services. We hadn't budged from that position. So what is, I mean, is there any, even any hope of a third way, of another way? Because no one's, the EU's not going to give way on this point. I mean, everybody's been saying the same thing for almost two years now. Angela exactly. Merkel said exactly. it again today. If you want to be part of the single market, you have to be part of the single market. And today, they just said that what we all thought already, and it was like Marianne said, that it was like a game of chicken. Nobody was willing to say it first. And now finally, you had Tusk saying it already. Juncker confirming it as well at their presser. We're not, we had, nothing's what is, happened today. What are we today. even negotiating if, you know, if, if nothing is on the table? Uh, Tomasz, uh, what, what is even at stake now? There's going to be no deal. I think there is a third way now mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, avoiding, uh, at least for the EU side, is avoiding that this, all this checkers talk about the future relationship uh, with the UK after Brexit and after a uh, transitional period, so after 2020, uh, just to put it in the very vague political, political declaration and now to focus on, on the only hot issues that means the, the Irish backstop. Uh, that has to be negotiated by all this future for three freedoms, uh, relations with the single market after transitional period since 2021 could be negotiated uh, later on in next year, in two years' time. Yeah, Sam, you want to say something? And don't forget that the EU keeps giving Theresa May a viable escape route to this. You had Donald Tusk is more than willing to say, if you want to change your mind, we're here for you. Uh, the uh, Prime Ministers of Malta and the Czech Republic today said, second referendum, we're all unanimous. If you want to do it, you have our blessing. Basically go back to where yeah. we, we were the, before. The guy who wrote Article 50 has said, if you want to tear it up, revoke it. You know, it's an unlikely option, but there are options. All right. You know, we are talking about this and, you know, high, what's happening in high politics, but people are actually very concerned about how it will impact them. Because as Brexit negotiations continue, there are many people back in the UK who have been busy Googling their country's imminent departure. Alex Morgan in the Cube in Lyon has been digging into that. Alex? Well, Tessa, let's break away from the Brussels bubble, the Salzburg summit and the Westminster uh, gang, if you like. And let's look at what people are actually Googling, people in the UK. What questions are they asking? This data provided to us in the cube uh, by the search giant. And these are the top five questions in the last week on the uh, word Brexit. Now, number one, when is Brexit? People want to know when people are leaving. But look at number two. What is Brexit? That is still being asked. Number three here, will house prices uh, go down after Brexit? People concerned what this means for their property. Then four, will Brexit happen? People wondering now, I imagine even more so after the day's developments, will this be taking place? And five, what is the checkers deal for Brexit? Well, apart from that dead, according to Darren there. Um, so let's just bring you some other uh, questions as well. People 
On the question of a second referendum, we heard it there about Malta, what the politicians are saying. This is what the people are asking. Here we go. Will there be a second referendum? Number two, how can we stop Brexit? You imagine that's coming from the Remain side there. Three, how likely is a second referendum? Uh, four, a little bit optimistic there. When is the second referendum? Uh, no date, of course, set for that. And five, will Labour, that's the opposition party in the UK, back a second referendum? But I think what we're getting here, this data, this is what people are Googling, what they're searching, typing into their phones, their computers. This is what people in the UK are actually asking, what is actually on their mind. And the, I think definitely the sense we're getting here is there is questions about what Brexit is, what Brexit means, what it entails, and even if Brexit will happen. In fact, we've been looking across the whole of Europe and other Google data. And that question, what is Brexit? It's being asked in Ireland, Germany, Spain, Malta. It is being asked across the European Union. So you've also got to ask the question, what is the European Union? What is London doing to communicate with people who will be directly impacted by this Britain and EU divorce, Tessa? All right, thank you for that, uh, Alex and the Cube team. I'll, I'll put that, that to you, Marion. What is Brexit? People are still asking, what is Brexit? When is Brexit? What does that tell you about people's understanding and maybe their fear and the uncertainty yeah. surrounding it? Well, I think Thanks, people were you. fed a line that Brexit means we make our own laws, <laughs> we make our own trade deals, and all will be well. Hey. And that's the simplified version that was fed to people without any explanation of what the practicalities were, that if you're going to make your own trade deals, what happens to the trucks when they get to Dover if there's no agreement? What happens to the, the produce coming from farmers in the UK that has 48 hours to get to France or to Germany? Yeah. What about the person who's concerned about their cancer drugs? So have drugs? politicians failed in, in communicating that, as Alice was pointing out? Have they failed to make people understand exactly where they're headed? Yes, I think they have. But the, the truth also so is, Tessa, that if you want to convince people of something, and I'm being absolutely upfront, you've got to give simple, straightforward messages, hopefully the truth. So in that context, I think even many politicians in the UK had no concept of the complexity of the relationship. And as I said, how it impacts on everything from the flights going in and out of Heathrow or Birmingham I mean, that's to what the cancer drugs now, crossing the border. And even the Mini Cooper, it mm. has to cross twice to the continent before it's finally ready to roll off. Nobody thought about any of this. And now, there's no doubt to the wall. And certainly, nobody thought about the impact on the border in Ireland and about the east-west trade. All right. There's more on this, of course, a lot more to talk about. Well, as Theresa May a defence checkers in Salzburg, her political opponents are on the offensive, actually, back home in London. A salacious document has surfaced detailing a secret plan for her replacement. It's all in today's Power Play. When the cat's away, the mice will play. The document, leaked to the Telegraph and circulating among Tory MPs, says May will be asked to resign in May. And it includes a list of possible replacements with their pros and cons. David Davis, it reads, too late. Liam Fox, fading. Jeremy Hunt, dark horse. Boris Johnson, the bookie's favourite, it says, but the frontrunner never wins. The merciless memo was reportedly written back in April, but has resurfaced now. bit of Game of Thrones happening there, right, <laughs> Sam? Uh, w this is, uh, I mean, this would impact the transition if May is ousted and the instability, instability. I mean, this is really like watching a derivative political satire, but it's happening 24-7 all the time. I mean, yeah. this memo is, <laughs> Boris won't win because people think he will win. You know, it's this kind of Orwellian nightmare that uh, Westminster is kind of going through at the moment, where you're starting to think that the politicians from... 10 years ago are now mm. uh, decent. Uh, but it does, <laughs> and yeah, and Thomas, watching it from, from the EU's point of view, I mean, this is certainly, they're, they're watching the uncertainty in, 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 in the it's, UK's yes, political classes, on, of course. Yes, on the one hand, but, and I have no clue how it uh, ends sure. up. Uh, but the only thing I know, I covered the UK elections last year, and I remember many politicians and experts there uh, in London then, uh, predicting Theresa May to be replaced in two or three months. That's right. And she's quite good in, uh, as a survivor. It of, seems like she has nine lives, right? Game. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we'll see. 
Yeah, and but but this but she's. Do you think that there's any chance of her remaining in power, or this is it? This is it for her. Check. Looking well, at I've, what's happened I've today. I've always even. felt in my gut that Theresa May would never jump off the cliff of a hard Brexit. But my concern was, will she be pushed, and who's going to push her? And if you look at that list, that's what you're looking at. But she's still holding because. Every business person in the UK, I have no doubt, is lobbying every single MP, every politician, because they can't even countenance it. Ordinary people maybe don't fully understand the implications, but as soon as they do, I believe there'll be a tsunami to stop a hard Brexit. I'm not saying stop Brexit, but stop the hard Brexit. And that means that those who are threatening her will lose a certain amount of their ground. But there's convulsions going on. It, politics is really divided mm -hmm. in the UK. And to me, that's actually very sad for a decent, pragmatic people. And with just six months to go, I mean, Brexit, we'll hear Brexit all the time, uh, the Irish border, the customs union, all of it we will keep discussing. Yeah. But now let's leave it at that for now because we'll move on to a different topic. Hungary's uh, Viktor Orban may be putting on a friendly face to his fellow EU leaders in Salzburg. But behind their backs, it's a different story. Just before leaving for the summit, Orban's government launched a media campaign against the European Parliament. Check it out. Well, look at that. The ad. It's posted on the government's Facebook page, calls on Hungarians to, quote, defend Hungary against Article 7. Now, this is a move that imposes sanctions on a country for breaching core EU values. Now, the alliance for liberals and Democrats didn't waste any time. They responded to that and they released their own campaign on Twitter. Let's look. Since 2010, Viktor Orban is the Prime Minister of Hungary. In order to consolidate his power, Mr. Orban is creating a corrupt oligarchy in Hungary. Critics say its economic structure is becoming a miniature version of Vladimir Putin's Russia, where business success is intertwined with political power. The difference is that Hungary has built this system within the EU, in part using EU funds. Tomáš, you were interested in Hungary. Is Viktor Orban winning the PR war? Obviously, he's winning the, the war in Hungary. His uh, sup support for, 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 for his party and for himself is very high. But I think he's losing the PR war at the EU level. I think that his aim in the EU for, for a few years now was to... Uh, to change the direction of the uh, of the, the main force here of the center right European People pa uh, European uh, People Party, so his uh, fraction here in the European Parliament and on the EU level, in fact uh, he was very good to to, to 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 be on the edge of the mainstream, but he didn't want to be out of the mainstream because you can't change the 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 the, the, the policy of the main group being outside outside, and now he lost the game. Now he's seen as closer to Matteo Salvini to Marine Le Pen, but. He, that that is not his aim. But when you say when you say he's losing the PR war in the EU, I think you're you're referring to politicians and us watching, you know, journalists, etc. But I'd like to look at the difference between the two. This is the Alde uh, your, your group's um, ad. I mean, there is this simplistic, fun uh, ad versus something that's more informational. But which one actually gets people reacting? And you know, people probably won't. Depends on who the audience is. I mean, I mean, I think we're trying to convince people, aren't, aren't yeah. we, at the end of the day? But I mean, in Paul, sorry, in, in Hungary, um, it's sort of like Hungary versus the EU. Those awful bureaucrats sitting in Brussels, the faceless people, uh, etc. And I mean, if you can engineer a common enemy, even if it's the EU, with its values of solidarity, rule of law, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, etc. If you can cast that institution as a common enemy, then it's very hard to appeal to people because people are busy going about their lives. They're not hugely interested. So maybe there, there should be a change in communication, perhaps, from the rest of, you know, from the rest of the, for the other people in the, in, in the EU. I mean, yeah, unfortunately, to go back to Brexit, I mean, the EU was criticised enough for not getting involved before the referendum was held. You know, you didn't see much about um, these kind of videos like Alde has brought out. And I think it's not, it's not a great video in my view, you sure. know, aesthetically or whatever, but it, it gives all the facts. 
you know, it's not resorting to kind of cheap populism like the other one is. You know, it's not giving sure, but the, you the lies. Part, the question you know, there is, is it effective? That's, that's yeah, and I'd point, like to yeah. go back to a point that Tomasz was making earlier, because Viktor Orban's Fidesz group belongs to the European People's Party. It's mm -hmm. the biggest party at the European Parliament. It's been under pressure to kick out Orban. But have a listen to what the EPP leader, Joseph Dahl, said last night. Und ich habe immer gesagt, die Presse kann mich nicht erzwingen, den Viktor Orbán rauszuschmeißen. Wir haben Demokratie in unserer Partei, wir haben Recht, État de droit, wir haben unsere Freiheit und wir haben Regeln. I mean, are their hands tied? I mean, I think, what, what, is, what is behind that decision to just keep him at the EPP despite, you know, the vote? I think it's a, a simple case of not wanting to fracture their party before the biggest moment of the last five years, the European elections next year. Mm -hmm. We had the vote last week in Strasbourg on Article 7 where it was pretty clear what MEPs thought about Hungary's recent slide. Um, and where he says the press can't force them to kick Viktor Orban out. I'm sorry, that's not the press that is forcing him to do anything here. It's people finally, you know, Hungary was a massive story last week the actual reasons for it being a massive story over the last few months hasn't been. So it's, it's, a, strate it's a strategic move. As an MEP, how do you feel about that, that, this decision? I can imagine they're quite conflicted in the EPP. As you say, the elections are coming up and they're looking at the size of their group. And there is, I think, little doubt that both the, the right in the parliament and the left in the parliament are probably bleeding MEPs to the far right and the far left. So they're looking at numbers because at the end of the day, when you go into that plenary, it's numbers that count. However, you know, if you look, I mean, before I came down here, I had a look again at the what we voted on last week in Strasbourg. And when you see the list of organizations from the UN to the Venice Commission to the Court of Justice, you know, that have either ruled against Hungary or spoke about what's happening there in regard to the judiciary, mm -hmm. academic freedom, freedom of expression, etc. You really would be very concerned. On the other hand, sometimes people believe, you know, keep your friends close and your, and your enemies, your enemies closer. And sometimes better to have people in the tent. But, but Hungary has crossed a line. I mean, they really have. And, and this is the decision they came to. Yeah. I mean, there are other people who would defend Viktor Orban in this. But again, we'll leave it at that for, t for tonight. Thank you very much, Marianne. And thank you, Tomas and Sam, for that. Well, we have a lot more coming up for you on Raw Politics. We will get the latest on what the European leaders decided this week on the migration crisis, another massive issue. Darren McCaffrey will join us again in a moment. And the EU launches a preliminary investigation into Amazon. And it's hardly the first time Europe has targeted tech. We'll dig into that a little later. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, it's the final day of the EU Leader Summit in Salzburg. And besides Brexit, the other big issues on the agenda was, of course, migration. And we bring in again our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, who is in Salzburg with the latest news on that. So, Darren, there was nothing on Brexit, but what about migration? Uh, well, I think it's fair to say nothing there as well. There was a, uh, a sense in which they set out where they do agree, these EU leaders, and it does seem every time they talk about uh, migration, Tessa, uh, the divisions become more and more apparent. But Donald Tusk did suggest that there is agreement, of course, on wanting to stop the flow of migrants uh, to Europe, that they do all agree they want stronger borders, and that they want to work with third countries to try and stop that. Now, interestingly, uh, there was a form of announcement that they are going to have a special summit in Egypt next year that they want to work with President Sisi there to try and essentially set up a camp in Egypt as a holding centre for migrants to stop them from reaching the European Union. That's a pretty controversial move in itself. But there was also little sign that any actual real substantial deal was on the table. Let's listen to the EU Council President Donald Tusk speaking this afternoon. The migration debate showed that we may not agree on everything, but we agree on the main goal, which is stemming illegal migration to Europe. There was a constructive debate and good atmosphere, and we decided to continue our focus on what unites us and what has already brought results. This means strengthening our external borders 
as well as strengthening cooperation with third countries. Now, this failure to make any substantial progress on, on migration, and there is continued discussions on this Jean-Claude Juncker idea of 10,000 extra personnel for a border force. That is being looked at and talked about. But the failure is simply because, of course, EU leaders are not united on this subject. It is against the backdrop of a fall in migration to Europe. We believe by around 85%. It is back to pre-crisis levels. But ultimately, as Donald Tusk summed it up yesterday, he said that, yes, some EU leaders, Tessa, are willing to reach a deal on this. Others want to exploit it as an issue. And I suspect, given that there are European elections next year, we're not likely to see a deal anytime soon. Thank you for that, uh, Darren McCaffrey there in Salzburg. I mean, before we get into everything that Darren just told us, let's look back a little because this issue erupted over the summer this year when the Aquarius rescue ship was stranded at sea with hundreds of migrants on board. Now, it thrust the migrant crisis to the top of the EU agenda. And three months later, Euronews' correspondent Annelise Borges has followed up with the people she met on board the ship. Here's her latest report. Uh, this TNA means what you have. It means what you have. To hear Ola Jumoke describe the difference between having and being is a moving experience, especially because this family from Nigeria was left with very little after surviving the crossing from Libya and arriving in Europe. Now they are starting from scratch, but are grateful for it. We have good accommodation, and at the same time, we are feeding, we lack nothing, you know? The family has been living in a modest but comfortable apartment near the center of Valencia, provided by an NGO for the time their asylum request is being processed. For those helping the new arrivals, offering them a real chance of life in Europe involves integrating them into society, and that is the real challenge. No solo, no solo es salvarles la vida sino que creo que hay que dar un salto más y, y, y que veamos cómo podemos convivir. Y yo creo que ahí es donde quizás podemos tener dificultades, porque cada persona es un mundo y en España, como en cualquier otro país, pues hay una serie de elementos con los que hay que trabajar y que hay que sensibilizar mucho a la gente respecto a, a, a que somos iguales y que la diversidad nos enriquece, no nos resta. Not everyone agrees Europe stands to benefit from the diversity migrants and refugees bring to the continent. But among those arriving, there are some determined to show they are eager for a chance to contribute to a better version of Europe. I would like to join the um, humanitarian rights. Yes, I would like to support, maybe like supporting the UN, supporting the Caritas, other organizations, because I know more people will still, there will be, even in 10 years time, I know some people will still be in my shoes. The show I have today, there will still be a lot of people in that shoe. So I would like to support the government in giving to the helpless. Whether or not Ola Jumoke can give back to Europe some of the good she has received will depend on Europe accepting her and her family first. Annelise Borges, Valencia, Spain, for Euronews. Well, back with me is uh, Sam Morgan, a reporter at Euractive uh, in Brussels. We also have Tomasz Bielecki, and he is a Brussels correspondent for Poland's Gazeta, and Marianne Harkin. She's an Irish MEP for the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats in Europe. Just a very quick round, guys. You know, migration uh, is, is an issue that is going to be here to stay. Where is the next point that you're looking at? What is next on this issue, Sam? Well, as we heard from Darren about this, um, you know, potential deal with Egypt about setting up camps there or something, if you fast, you know, go backwards to the EU-Turkey deal from a few years ago worth something like 3 billion euros, that came with a whole host of other problems like human rights, um, the, the coup attempt in Turkey. Would something that we have with Egypt, would there be more strings attached to that so that it would be more of a, a fair deal for everybody in a way? So that, that'll be interesting to see how 
the EU if it, if it actually goes, gets if it even goes anywhere. Exactly. And what about you, Thomas? Where is the next point, the uh, next step yes, that you want to I don't expect for? A, a huge one solution very mm -hmm. soon. It needs step-by-step uh, -step, uh, tactics, and I agree that this uh, deals with, uh, with Egypt and uh, other North African countries are the major main steps uh, in, in the future to, to, to be made. But in fact, the numbers of, of the migration now are not crisis numbers. Yes, exactly. we have the political crisis, so I'm afraid that the problem will be exploited in the electoral campaigns in, in forthcoming months. Yes. So many politicians don't want to have the solution now, in fact. Mm -hmm. ah, so it yeah. will the be political th yeah. business model is to have crisis. So that's how you foresee it, to be used as a topic I, in I politics? I couldn't have said it better. Okay. Their political business model is to have crisis because they exploit that. And that's what I'd be concerned about. But I would say that finally, you know, not so much finally, but very much step by step, we're getting a little bit of flesh on the bones. Juncker talking about his 10,000 extra border guards, some kind of partnership with Africa, etc. People in the EU, it, it's not so much that they fear migrants, mm. it's that they fear the EU isn't dealing with it, that nobody is in control. And when people think that nobody is managing, that's when people are easy to convince that migrants are the root of their problem. It's and very... the, the forthcoming elections could be a flashpoint, but the more we put flesh on the bones, the more we can say to people, no, it's not solved, but we're getting there. Indeed. And this is a you know, very important and serious uh, topic that yes. we will be watching, especially as the elections uh, come yeah. forward. But first, we are going to lighten the mood a little bit because as the uh, Salzburg summit wraps up, we have been taking a look at some of the moments which perhaps didn't make it onto your screens. It turns out that aside from the diplomacy and statesmanship, Europe's politicians, they're not so different from us after all. That's today's Eurostars. Giorgio Armani once said jeans represent democracy in fashion. Well, you have to wonder if Viktor Orban had that in mind as he arrived in Salzburg amid a democracy spat with the EU. According to Donald Tusk, he needed to cool down emotions ahead of the summit. He posted this photo on his Instagram page. A day later, this one with Theresa May with a not-so-subtle caption, Sorry, no cherries. And finally, Angela Merkel in the nutcracker. The German chancellor was captured struggling to crack a nut during dinner. Eventually, she appears to give up. Well, let's hope she and other leaders have a stronger resolve when it comes to Brexit and migration. Well, there you go. They're human after all. Which one uh, did you like the most there? I like Donald Tusk. I really like Donald Tusk. I mean, this the is probably... video he did last week as well, or two weeks ago, with his uh, upcoming pics, you know, yeah. the trailer for the action movie. But do you think this is probably an image of politicians that people should see a bit more? Yeah, I mean, earlier we had a photograph of all the men in suits. I think sure. there was three men. And I thought three. to myself, you know, does that really represent your, the people who are looking at it? So, you know, well done to Orban on the jeans. On that point <laughs> only. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Thomas, you have something to I add? I think the Merkel uh, was the best. Uh, the Merkel one? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, well, we will have a lot more for you coming up after the break. A serious topics targeting a big tech as Europe launches an investigation into Amazon. We ask if the EU is tech obsessed or is it the Robin Hood of regulation? That's after a short break. Welcome back to our politics. Now, the European Commission is going after more big tech companies, and this time it's Amazon and Facebook's turn again. Well, the EU's formidable competition commissioner, Margrethe Vestager, has a penchant for going after tech titans. And now she's launched a preliminary investigation into Amazon over concerns that it's trawling data from third party sellers to unfairly predict the next big thing. Meanwhile, her colleague Vera Jourova is hot on Facebook and Airbnb's heels. So is the European Commission's anti-tech or is it a trailblazer in regulating Silicon Valley's unwieldy multinationals? Now, before we get into this with our panel, let us hear exactly what Margrethe Vestager and Vera Jourova had to say on these issues. If you, as Amazon, get the data from the smaller merchants that you host, uh, which can be, of course, completely legitimate because you can improve your service uh, to these uh, smaller merchants. Well, 
Do you then also use these data to do your own calculations as what is the new big thing? What is it that people want? What kind of offers do they uh, like to, 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 to receive? Uh, what makes them buy things? Uh, I will not uh, reveal that uh, or hide that uh, I am becoming uh, rather impatient because we have been in dialogue with Facebook almost two years and I, I really want to see uh, uh, not a progress, it's not enough for me. I want to see the results. And joining us here in the studio, we have a Jennifer Baker. She is a tech journalist here in Brussels. We also have David Martin. He's a senior legal uh, officer from Bayuk. It's a consumer organization. And we have still with us uh, Sam. I apologize, I forgot your name. <laughs> but you have Sam. <laughs> He's still with us on this panel. Now, I'd like to start with you, uh, Jennifer. This, uh, this um, Amazon case, Facebook case, Margareta Vestager going after these big tech companies. Is it uh, a sign of the EU being ahead of its time, actually? Well, very possibly. I mean, we hear an awful lot of, you know, rhetoric about how Margaret Vestager is anti-America. And I think that's just symptomatic of the fact that these big tech companies do come from the States. Um, and, you know, I've seen a lot of accusations of EU protectionism around this. But, you know, with the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation having come into force, the focus is very much on data. And I think what Vestager has been saying is she wants to bring this element of data because that's kind of, you know, we hear data is the new oil. Uh, she wants to bring that very much into competition cases. And, uh, you know, she's right because we think about the big tech companies and there's really only a handful of them running the whole show. I mean, find me someone who doesn't use at least one of the services of, of Facebook or Google or Amazon. I mean, what, what is at stake here? The issue of, of privacy, the issue, uh, you know, David, I want to put that, that to you. What is the biggest uh, issue at stake here that the EU is trying to protect? Well, it's a basic con consumer protection. It's the rights of consumers. It's also the privacy of consum consumers. And also the competition landscape is very important that uh, there's a competitive landscape also from a point of view of consumer protection, consumer welfare and consumer choice. And I would like to echo that, uh, in my opinion, there's no anti-American or anti-tech motive here. It's just the commission do it, doing its job. It doesn't matter if it's an American, a German, or a French company. If you do business here in Europe, you have to comply with our rules. Mm. And Sam Morgan, I will keep calling you that now, is, uh, is, is the EU doing a good job so far? I mean, if you take the Commission as this kind of guardian of the rules, it is doing its job. I think the only thing about the Amazon case that maybe is the thing that is raising eyebrows is that it was kind of unprovoked. It wasn't a competitor kind of saying, oh, look what Amazon is doing. You know, it's not saying that the Commission doesn't have a right to go into these matters, but you can see why a big tech giant would go, you know, nobody asked you to do this, in a way. All right, but let's, let's, let's look at, um, you know, what other big tech company key payouts that we have had uh, from the EU Commian, European Commission, because, you know, it has raked in some pretty sizey sums from Silicon Valley over the last few years. Let's look, we had Apple that was forced to pay back 13 billion euros in taxes to Ireland in 2016. Facebook, 110 million, quickly followed by Google, who had to fork out 2.4 billion in 2017. And just last July, Google had to once again pay a record 4.34 billion euros. I mean, are these tech companies going to be deterred? Well, I mean, I think that's the idea. I mean, you know, that, I mean, it's, these figures are sort of drops in the ocean to them, but that's why, you know, we've got new rules that can be 10% of global turnover, not just EU turnover. I mean, when you think about, so for example, the, the Apple case, you know, that's money going back into the Irish coffers because it was deemed to be illegally helping out one particular company. And you, you can't really allow countries to do that. And the reason some of them are so big is because they're able to shop around between different countries and pay next to no corporation tax. And, and what about, but David, for consumers' point of view, what about, you know, you, you go onto Amazon, it's really convenient when it can <laughs> predict what you want next. I mean, that's not so bad, is it? It's, it's a convenient service for consumers, but it, if it's not playing by the rules and if it's preventing other services that could also be very convenient for consumers from actually rising, we have a problem because we have a, a there's no consumer choice, basically, and prices could rise and it could abuse its dominant, its dominant position. And that's a problem from a consumer perspective. All right. And, 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 and what about... Um, you know, the, the other side of the, the story. This, when Google and these companies come in here, they say, well, look, we're actually bringing in jobs, we're bringing in technology, we're bringing in all the good stuff. So what, what is there to complain about? I mean, I, you said about, you know, it's convenient, but it's also a slippery slope. You know, where do you go from if you don't protect the rules? I mean, that is what the EU is there for. It's a rules-based block. 
as soon as they start saying, oh, it's good for innovation or it's good for jobs, but you know, it's is there is there a point of maneuver though from the from a regulation point of view? Is there is there a, a space to move towards tech companies or the other way around? Well, I think, I mean, one of the things with, with some of this regulation that, you know, the GDPR, I keep coming back to, it's my favorite this subject. This is the privacy, the, the privacy yeah. law for um, you. I mean, it's kind of setting a global standard. You know, we see, we see other countries around the world sort of reflecting that and adopting that. And so it's kind of creating this new, if you like, new marketplace for consumers who do care about their privacy. It's like, oh, well, you know, we want to emulate what they're doing in the EU. So that's a really good thing. I mean, you even see in California coming up with its own privacy law. So even, you know, the US is, is looking to Europe to, you know, try and reflect what we're doing here. And right. that can create a whole new set of industries. You know, there's lots of new uh, sort of messaging okay. apps that are encrypted. And, you know, they, these, these, these are created because they're in competition with these you know, kind of slightly unscrupulous anyway, a lot bigger more players. To come that we will be keeping an eye on. But first, uh, let's move to our uh, raw moment uh, of the evening because U.S. Uh, President Donald Trump isn't exactly known as a master wordsmith, and he may have proved it once again, this time with his take on water. Let's take a look. I just want to thank all of the incredible men and women who have done such a great job in helping with Florence. This is a tough hurricane. One of the wettest we've ever seen from the standpoint of water. And it certainly is not good. Yeah, quick reaction there. <laughs> Guys, what do you think? <laughs> Entertaining. <laughs> yeah, hurricanes aren't good. Well done, Mr. Oh, Trump. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> if he's not calling Juncker a tough cookie, he's calling know, hurricanes a tough one, cookie. Exactly. So. Every day there's something new from Donald Trump. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists tonight and thank you for watching us on, on Raw Politics. We'd like to hear your views. Tell us what you're talking about. I'm on Twitter, Tessa or Celia, or follow us at Euronews and use the hashtag RawPolitics. Have a good evening. <laughs>